I'll wait. Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 44. Don't forget, as usual, you have your notes section on the back. Please feel free to take any notes that um, something that I might say or the Lord might want you to make note of for later study yourself. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 44. And we'll be reading through verse 53. If you don't have your Bibles with you, the Scripture will be on the screen. Please feel free to follow along with me. Then He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then He said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of My Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Verse 50, And He led them out as far as Bethany, and He lifted up His hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while He blessed them that He was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped Him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. If you will bow your heads as we pray over the time of the Word this morning. Dear Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word. We thank You, Father, that Your Word is still a living and breathing document that speaks to the hearts of man to convict, to instruct, to challenge. God, I pray this morning, God, that Your Word would find lodging place in our hearts. God, that You would touch my body, my physical throat, God, but also that I would be touched in my mind, in my spirit, to speak only the words You'd have me to speak this morning, dear Father, and that those words would go out and find place in the hearts of Your people that are here and those that are online listening this morning. God, be with us this morning that we would have a new reflection on the ascension as we celebrate Ascension Sunday this morning. We thank you, God, and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. For those who are doing the additional supplementary readings and, and study, um, the Scriptures for this week are Acts 1, 1-11. through 11. The Psalm that we read in service this morning of Psalm 47, 1-9. through 9, And Ephesians 1, 15-23. If you did not catch any of those, please do ask me after service. I'll be glad to give those to you for further study. See, the finished work of Christ has forever been consummated in the eternity of God. In Christian theology, the ascension is the consummation or the completion of Christ's entire ministry and mission here on earth. You see, the accomplishments of Christ, the graces of the incarnation of Him coming in human flesh, the cross and the resurrection have been brought before the Father in the presence of many witnesses and in the eternal kingdom of God. You see, in the ascension, these works have been immortalized forever. The mysteries of the Incarnation, the cross and the resurrection, the efficacy of these events have been consummated in eternity in the intimacy of life of God and the triune God of Father, Son and Holy Spirit brought together. You see, it was one thing at the cross to say it is finished, which was true. But you see, His ascension had a finiteness to it that wrapped up His time here on earth. Because as you know, He ascended to heaven to complete His earthly time, but to go to prepare a place for us and to send a comforter in the meantime for the work of the church to be done. What's powerful here as we look at, at Luke 24, 45 is the divine spirit and the human understanding aspect that I think is so important for us to focus on. In this particular scripture here, I love that there's many things that he could have said and done here. But in verse 45 it says, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. 
I don't know about you, but I want Him to open my understanding to His Word. If this is just becomes a book that's dusty and, and, and sits on a shelf, it, it, it does nothing for us. But when we grab onto the fact that God intentionally spoke His Word, gave it to mankind so that we might have His Word for our understanding, for our betterment, and for the betterment of spreading the gospel, it'll change things. It'll change how you live. It'll change how you be. It'll change your, how your relationships correspond. It'll change everything. Because His Word is still active and still moving and still piercing the heart of man. You see, what's powerful to note here as we look here is that um, there's an intimacy with the connection of human intelligence and the action of the Spirit. Let me explain. You know, we could look here at the idea of the scriptural um, story Jesus told of the talents. Some He gave five, some three, some one. You see, there's often times in, in our humanity we want to go, well, God, I'm not as smart as such and such. I'm not this. I'm not that. And we look at our lack, forgetting God intentionally, fearfully and wonderfully made you. So to say, Father, I lack is to spit on the intention of the Father. Now that's a bit extreme, but I want to show you the fact that God, God thought deeply about you. God put you together in such a way for the betterment of the body and of the furthering of the kingdom of God that He may receive glory. I've uh, read many stories of various believers, um, various fathers and mothers of the faith. And a few of them that I've read who suffered, for instance, with a physical ailment and were never healed on this side of glory, often were heard or pinned saying that it was never the intention of the healing on this side of glory. That wasn't the, the point. Could He have healed them? Sure. But to show that they were able to persist even still was still giving God glory. Now, do I believe in divine healing? I do. We can discuss that later. But my point is, these various fathers, mothers of the faith that said, it was basically the similar thing of like Paul said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Was that no matter what, no matter what my current situation, yet will I serve him. I have a, a dear friend and his wife. Uh, that friend has now since passed. But during his sickness, before he passed, his wife was unwavering, saying, I believe God can heal Jared. But if God doesn't choose to heal him on this side, Jared's story will still be to bring God glory. As the wife of Jared, we're still going to do the things to give God glory. I say that to, to, to encourage you that no matter where you find yourself today, your life is meant to bring Him glory if you are willing to actually give it to Him. I heard a quote once that basically said, the devil feasts on what you don't give to God. I'm going to give you a little bit of explanation of what that means. We're meant to surrender all that we are to God as a worship and as a glory to Him. Our words, our actions, our relationships, the list goes on. But that which you don't give, the devil gets to feast on. Now that's not biblical directly, but the, the purpose of that quote was to say, if you're not going to give it to God, it, I mean... Why do you have it? It's like the back to the talent story. It's like the guy that had one that went and buried it in the field and gave it back to the father. Well, father, I kept it, but that wasn't the purpose of the talent. The purpose of that talent was to use it for his glory. It was to be like the one with five and three who multiplied their talents because they were intentional with what God gave them. Now, I say that to encourage and to give you the thought here to think about in our walk with God, we are meant to persist in our understanding. We are meant to observe, to hear, to read, to reflect, to reason, to construct, to produce, and to grow that our intelligence may be further opened and enlarged so that God may further use us. 
for His kingdom. You see, I desire for God to miraculously give me understanding. But in the meantime, I'm going to do my part to further what I can on earth's side. I'm going to read this Bible. I'm going to read the commentaries, the footnotes. I'm going to read it in its original languages and parts that I can de- try my best to understand. I'm going to listen to men and women who have studied it and went to university who have, are great anointed speakers. I'm going to do what I can to absorb what I can so that I may better serve the God that gave me so much life. You see, what I think though is a powerful impaction here is as this progresses through in verse 46 talking about He said to them, thus it is written, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day for that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. What I love here about the fact that all nations was put there is at the end of the day it doesn't matter how you and I are different. It matters that the kingdom of God and the message of the gospel go forth to all nations and to all people. And using what I have in the meantime to do that. Just that. Lily and I have recently had various discussions, my oldest, by the way, for those that don't know, my oldest daughter, um, about sermon preparation. Yes, my eight-year-old wants to know how sermons get prepared. And what I think is wonderful about this is I get to talk to my eight-year-old that when I prepare to speak and to preach to the adults, there's many things that I do. But what I love is the heart of my eight-year-old. Because she knows that God's Word is powerful. Don't believe me? I'm going to tell you one of the things that she said. She says, Daddy, when we go upstairs, do you just stand there and read God's Word to them? Now, you may laugh and chuckle, and that's okay. You can chuckle. It's funny. Because as for those who are adults, you're like, no, the pastor will preach something that he's prepared. But the thing is, my daughter knows that the power of God's Word is, is, can stand on its own. Now, does God give man words? Absolutely. You've heard sermons, I'm sure, most of your life before you met me. But the fact is, I could stand here and read God's Word, and it will stand all on its own and can still pierce to the heart of man and still give life if I add no other words to it. But you know what's interesting? If I came in one Sunday and started reading, you'd look at me like I had three heads. You know why? Because you expect something when you come to this house. And when I don't meet your expectations, oh, well, it was an all right Sunday. Forgive us, God. If our expectations get in the way of what you want to do. I sit with my brothers. Um, there, there's a, there's a, a fraternal here and there of the pastors of the different churches. And I sat and I looked across the table this last week or this week. And I looked at them and I said, How often, brothers, are we going to be mindful that we can affect the change of Nairn? And how often are we going to be careful that we are helping our people not to inflict pain on each other? Because there's, there's often too much hurt that comes from the church. And I say that to be mindful that we were never meant to hurt each other, but we were also never meant to put false expectations on each other to be perfect. Hello? Because how often do people go, well, I'm not going to go back to that church. Those people, that's full of hypocrites. Well, guess what? The church is full of messed up people. You're not going to find one that's perfect. If you find one, <laughs> let me know. I've not seen one in my 32 years of life. Let me know if you find one. So what I say is to say this, is that God's intention is to fulfill His Word and for there to be a power in that. Insofar that this simple message has such depth to it that it can touch the heart of anyone and any man or woman if we are willing to open our mouth and speak it. What I love here though as it goes further on, In verse 49 says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Do you know what's interesting? He didn't tell them how they're going to be endued with power. You ever thought about that? Probably have. He said he said he's going to send a comforter, a paraclete, which we of course know is the Holy Spirit. But he never quite tells them when or how exactly this they're going to receive this power. 
But you know what they do? They don't question Him. Do you know what they do instead? They go to the upper room and they just start praying. They just start praying and praying and praying together. They tarry in a like space together knowing that they are there for a purpose. To follow the word of their Savior who said, Go, and you will be endued with that power. You see, at the ascension, you said he once again goes, it says he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. There's many discussion on what that blessing could have been, and I can give you that information later if you desire. But the fact that he desired in that moment before leaving to bless them, and um, theologians basically say that in that blessing, he would have reached out his hands, as it says here, revealing once again those marks of the scars of, his, uh, of the nail prints in his hands. What was powerful in that is knowing that he was once again reminding them of the encouragement of here's what's happened and here's what you will tell mankind and I bless you in the name of the Father to go do the work he is for you to do. But I go with you even if I'm not physically there. The paraclete, the Holy Spirit also goes with you so that you are empowered to do that. And then of course as we know as after he blesses them, he then once again departed and carried up into heaven and I love that they're, that part of what they're, their first experience is just straight to go into worship. They could have decided in their humanity to, to be negative and go, what now? He said he blessed us, now what? But instead they go, I'm, we're going to worship. We're going to give thanks for what's to come. Do you know what's interesting? They didn't realize that at the time, but they were worshiping for both the good and the bad that would happen. You know, we like to believe, oh, well, the Bible says that they started in Jerusalem. They started close to home. That must have been better for them. Do you know how hard it would have been to give the gospel in Jerusalem, the center of Jewish history and culture, who was so deep and not, not holding to the, to the... It wouldn't have been easy. But then they were called, of course, as we know, to go from Jerusalem and to each of the other, the other remote parts here, as we see here. And then, of course, as we know, it goes on further to say that they continued in the temple praising and blessing God. Sorry, my other notes are loading. Give me a second. <laughs> so I think what's powerful here is part of this call was that ye are to be witnesses. As you might know, a witness is someone, of course, who observes something and is able then to share what they saw. You see, in moments of doubt, danger, or depression that would come, their remembrance as being witnesses would give them the encouragement and strength needed to push on. You see, works of power, which were invariably works of pity or of even of kindness of some nature, once again, would go forth Words, words of truth and grace from these mortal men's lips would be words that would touch the hungry hearts of man and would be used by God to meet the hungry soul. Sufferings and sorrow would come, but this obs observation as being witnesses would give them the patience needed to push on. And though death was the, was the end for all, it was now something that they would welcome as the, tra as the transition, if you will, from earth to, 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 to the glory of, of their God anyway. You see, there was a valuableness in their service to Him, which was powerful to know this. You see, what's great though is this is a, in, in verse 49 here of chapter 24, we are given a little snapshot into spiritual strength. You see, it came to pass once again, as we see here, that the apostles of the Lord became strong men and women of faith. But this, of course, was not always so. You see, before the ascension, there was an insufficiency. You know, we like to believe that the, the, oh, they were the disciples of Jesus. They didn't have it all together. Often, as we see through the book of Matthew and even in a little bit in Acts, kind of talking back, it talks a little bit about how their determination would falter. Their courage would be feeble sometimes and the understanding that they were learning at the master's arm, if you will, at his side, was 
not where it needed to be. But you see, this promise of power also would give them a fulfillment of the strength that had been spoken of generations before. Joel, as we know, has, has spoken, as well as Isaiah, of the strength that would come through the Holy Spirit. And what's powerful is this fulfillment resulted in the character of the disciples being strengthened. I don't know about you, but I want the Holy Spirit to bolster, to strengthen my character. Parents, you can do a great job raising your babies, but I want you to, I want, as your pastor, I want to tell you, I want the Holy Spirit to give them character like Him. You can teach good lessons, but I want the Holy Spirit to bolster it. And that's what's something that can be a permanent thing, but we often let the enemy take away our joy, our peace, the good things of God. We so easily let slip through our fingers the things that were meant to be that which sustained us. But be mindful that the Spirit is meant to be something that is a lasting impression in our lives. So I guess I want to encourage you this morning as we think through what the future looks like. Are you holding on to this story of the Gospel, what Jesus did, the sending of the Spirit, is it priceless to you? I've had talks with my children before and I'm sure you've thought similar things, but I'll go and remind you. Often how you treat something shows how you value something. Now I've had this talk with simple things like my children making sure they keep up their, up their water bottles or their toys or their little things. But I encourage you as believers, are you treating this gospel, this good news, this word, the things that were done to you, are you showing it like it has meaning to you or is it something that's so easily just put to the side? Or got off the shelf weekly, dust it off and go to church? Or is it something that you're living constantly out in your life? knowing that there is something God wants for you that is deeper if you're able to walk into it. You see, we need this same power today if we are to continue the mission of the apostles in the world and to, f to f fulfill the Great Commission. Regardless of what we believe, sometimes once again on certain aspects, the fact of the matter stands that we must believe that the Spirit is the one that does the regeneration, that the Holy Spirit is the one that does give us this new birth. It is through, once again, the power and strength of the Spirit working in us and through us to carry on the mission of Christ in the world that will give fruit to the proclamation of the gospel to the lost. We cannot do it on our own strength. We need the power of God manifested through us. And only God can save. We are merely instruments and vessels to be used for the glory of God. I want to tell you a little story of a man named John Wesley. You may have heard of him in a lot of Christian circles. He's a historian and theologian. John Wesley provided a great illustration for the point that early in his ministry, Wesley went on a mission to Georgia. When his mission proved ineffective, he realized that he himself needed to be converted and filled with the power of the Spirit before he could be used by God to bring the gospel to the Native Americans. John Wesley wrote of his experience in Georgia, I went to America to convert the Indians, or as we know them as Native Americans, but oh, who shall convert me? It wasn't until after Wesley's dramatic conversion experience that he then later had in London that his ministry took off and the mission became effective and fruitful as he followed the leading of the Spirit. Just as the apostles had to wait to be clothed with power from on high, John Wesley knew that he needed the Pentecostal experience to be truly effective in spreading of the gospel. Now, am I saying that you know you can't lead someone to God without the Spirit? I mean, you get the Spirit by measure, by the way, when you get saved, but that's a whole discussion. But as the fact is, I, walking in the fullness of the Spirit, you'll be able to do so much more. The Spirit's able to speak to you, bring things to your remembrance, to lead, to guide you in ways that it's unprecedented if you're not, if you don't have Him with you. And so it's powerful to want to grasp this and really understand it. You see, the response of the apostles to the final blessing, the ascension of Christ, communicated two important truths, both of which we can apply to our own lives. First, the disciples worshipped Jesus, treating Him as God Himself. 
I often remind you, is Jesus your Savior only or do you worship Him as being God? You know, I know it's hard for us in, in our minds to break up the triune Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but, through, but we worship Him in the fullness is what we're, is what we're called to do. And they wanting the disciples show this here. Second is the disciples gave God thanks and blessed Him. They should once again, this shall also be our response to the consummation of the finished work of Christ. You said forever the incarnation, forever the cross, the resurrection, the life of the Trinity, the in, 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 into eternity and everlasting communion. You see this loving relationship that's shared between Father, Son, and Spirit in the kingdom of God. The only proper response to the mystery of the ascension should be joy, should be worship, and should be thankfulness. And so what I, I, I call you to, to remind you, is that we are called once again to worship and to thank Him. As the scripture, as we see here, ends here, they were in the temple praising and blessing God. And they returned to Jerusalem with a great joy. What's interesting to me is they could have left in a whole other different state of emotion. Their shepherd was leaving them. They could have been angry. They could have been sad, upset. They could have not known what to do next, even though he gave them the next words, of course. But they instead went back with a joy that couldn't be shaken. Are you walking and living a life full of joy that can't be shaken? Now you're saying, but pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. I, I, I understand I don't know always what you're going through. But I, I, I do want to tell you this, that a joy that is found in Him can be unshakable. That's sometimes hard for us to to think through. We're like, but pastor, there's stuff going on. Or well, there has been stuff going on. Or I'm, I'm this or that. Yeah, but God is consistent. God is good. All hell can be coming against you and I promise you can remain in joy. You can remain in peace. Because once again, my human joy will fail. What I try to put together is peace can fail. My strength will fail. But when I find myself in Him, those things don't because they are from Him and they are eternal. Um, if every head will please bow and every eye will please close. Nobody looking around for me. Some important things I want to pray together. That's okay. I'm going up here. As we go into our time of altar call together, I have some things I want you to think about. Our altar call is actually going to be two part today. The first part is something I want you to spiritually think about. When thinking of this ascension, once again, the, like I said, the disciples could have thought about many things. But I want you to understand that this was a completion and a, was a process to go to the next season and step of their lives. So what I want you to do as your eyes are closed and you're focusing on Him and you're not looking around at the things around you, I want you to think about where you find yourself today. Take a little bit of a, a self-aware check. Where do you find yourself physically, with your health, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually today? I want you to understand and know that God can be the constant in each of those areas. And, but also that today, if you are not empowered and walking and following the leading of the Spirit, God can empower you to walk in that spiritual guiding. And like I mentioned earlier, I want your reaction and your where you are in life to be an outflowing of spiritual joy. And so, 
like I said, as, as, as everybody's, our, everybody's eyes are closed and every head is bowed so we can have focused time today, I want you to think about what do you need prayer for today? Do you need prayer for that joy that's unspeakable and full of glory? Are you in need of that empowering or even a refreshing in His Spirit? As I pray this next prayer, I want you to pray as well at your seats that God would lead and guide you and meet that need today. Because I know we're all going through different things today. So as I pray, please pray with me for yourself in those areas. Dear God, say, Father God, I thank you for every man and every woman under the sound of my voice this morning. God, I pray that no matter where they find themselves today, that you, God, are their source, their source of joy, of peace, of strength, of good things, their source of direction, of leading, and of guiding. Dear Father, I pray that if they find themselves lacking today in joy, God, renew the joy of their salvation. The joy, God, that can remind them of the goodness of the gospel, of this process that Jesus went through, of, and then, of course, to his ascension, that, of course, led to our empowering and our being now the forerunners of the gospel for him. So, God, no matter where we find ourselves today, I pray that you would give joy where joy is needed that you would give direction where direction is needed. God, I pray for those that feel like they are lacking or empty today. God, fill them anew and afresh with your Spirit. They feel that they are dry and not sure what to do. God, let them be open to your Spirit to minister unto the need that they have. Mm. God, I thank you. God, I thank you that you good, that you are consistent, that you care for me, that you care for us, and that your ascension wasn't the end of the story, it was the transition to the next part for the, believe, for the disciples and for the new believers to go forth and to be called into a repentance and to a following and to a changing of their lives so that regeneration, reconciliation back to you that they could basically, God, get themselves back in alignment to where they need it to be. God, I thank you. God, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Um, as I was praying, I um, couldn't get away from a certain thought. And so I am going to follow the leading of the Spirit. And I'll let you take up with God between you and Him what your thoughts are about it later. Um, as I was praying, I couldn't get away from the fact that we are called to invest in the growth of the church. We are called. Um, so I'm going to do something, and I hope you love your pastor afterwards. I love you regardless of how you react to me. And I, I wrestled with this. So I said, God, is it too, too soon to even mention something like this? And he said, no, just, you, you do what I say. Deal, deal. God's ruled me like that sometimes. So I'm going to be passing out an envelope. Um, to each person in the room um, to let you know um, my own children will be participating in this. I don't say that to toot our horn. I say that because I practice what I preach. And I've had talk with my children about this before. So I'm just going to be walking out something that they already are aware of. The envelope of what I'm going to be giving you is a purple envelope that says building fund. And you're like, Pastor, are we building? We are, in the future. I don't got plans to give you now. But what I'm telling you, though, is um, each of my children will be giving a pound to the building fund. 
And before you go, oh, that's a pound, Pastor Luke. That's going to go real far. Um, then you give more. I do encourage you. I'd like you to give a pound 